Welcome to uh, my presentation. Really glad to see you all here so late in the afternoon. Uh, thanks for staying. And uh, that shows that you really care. So I'm, uh, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, so first of all, uh, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Dennis Batilov, and uh, I am a solutions architect working uh, currently based in Luxembourg, working out of EMEA. Uh, my role is generally to help um, uh, companies move their infrastructure to the cloud, but I also specialize in machine learning, and hence I'm here. Um, now, when we talk with customers uh, who are interested in machine learning, oftentimes we notice a bit of a knowledge gap, a bit of a disconnect, where it's quite unclear which business problems machine learning can help you solve. Right, where can I apply machine learning in exactly what form, in combination with other technologies, and so on. And so one way to help uh, customers in this way is, uh, is to focus on very specific, very common uh, problems that uh, customers face. And of course, uh, customer churn uh, is a very common problem that virtually uh, all businesses uh, encounter in one form or another and really care about that problem. Uh, so my attempt here is to show how we can use machine learning uh, to solve this problem, to help solve this problem. First of all, what is customer churn? Right. Uh, usually, if you offer a service to your own customers, um, they, you know, after a while, might decide to leave. You hope that they don't, uh, and, uh, uh, but you also care a lot if they do decide to leave. Right? And that could be that they're leaving to a competitor, but doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Uh, they could also be leaving, uh, just abandoning the service altogether because they don't like uh, the idea of a service. Right? And, and you clearly want to be able to recognize this. Uh, and if you can recognize it early on, perhaps you can address it in some form. Maybe there's a way that you can uh, approach the customer and uh, try to increase the loyalty of that customer in some way, right? And help them understand that the service is useful. Okay, you, you have that opportunity. So we're gonna try to solve it with machine learning. And uh, first few words about uh, machine learning itself. Uh, it is a field of artificial intelligence, a subfield if you wish, and uh, AI itself, uh, as you know, borrows a lot from uh, many different fields in the science, like neuroscience, uh, operational research, uh, uh, informatics generally. Right? But what we're seeing recently is, is that AI and machine learning is really coming into the industry, industrial age, right? And lots of pr practical applications are starting to appear, and so clearly, the engineering aspects of this are becoming very, very important, right? So we want to be able to not only build a model, uh, but then also put it quickly to production. And that's one of the things that a service such as Amazon Machine Learning is uh, actually helping you with. Now, what are the different kinds of uh, machine learning that exist out there? Uh, one of them is robotics, and again, uh, here, um, you know, it's often unclear what are the different categories and how uh, they can help me in my uh, work. With robotics, of course, I'm showing you some examples that uh, are relevant to uh, Amazon, uh, right? We have the Kiva systems uh, that move uh, stuff in the warehouses. And, of course, you've heard of, of the drones. Um, now, in this kind of application, we could think of machine learning as trying to, you know, control uh, these robots. Okay, maybe this is a little bit too far-fetched. If the robot <laughs> is controlled by this, uh, this brain, we might be worried a little bit in terms of how, uh, you know, what kind of mistakes it can make uh, in a data warehouse and so on. But um, it could perhaps uh, use machine learning to correct its behavior. So for example, if uh, a wheel or motor is malfunctioning a little bit, right? We could try to learn and compensate for that, and we could use something um, uh, from a field that's near and dear to my heart, uh, and this is reinforcement learning, and this is one uh, kind of way of representing this, uh, uh, where the robots uh, interact with the system and experience the world and, and uh, make mistakes and, and, and learn uh, them. 
Another type of uh, machine learning or archival machine learning application is, of course, uh, image uh, recognition. And uh, there's some personal background uh, here because uh, I worked on uh, the Amazon uh, mobile application, the iPhone application. I was an engineer um, in Seattle. And when we launched, we launched this with a feature called Amazon Remembers. And you can snap a picture and it would identify a product in that picture and send you back a link uh, at Amazon. Now at the time when we launched, this was end of 2008, we used something called Mechanical Turk. And uh, you've probably uh, heard of this. Uh, jokingly, we call it artificial, artificial intelligence because uh, we have actually humans uh, performing the work. And so for, for tasks that are still difficult uh, for machines to solve, we can use humans. And uh, basically, this created a really fascinating social experiment. I, I, I have fond memories of uh, working in that team because, um, uh, you know, you had on the one hand, one uh, category of people taking pictures and indirectly interacting with another group of people who are trying to identify products in these pictures. And that led to um, sometimes humorous interactions where, you know, a person would write uh, on a post-it note, what is the meaning of life, right? Take a picture of it and send it back and maybe you'll get back a book of some kind or maybe your photo was fuzzy and you get back a book on how to take pictures, right? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there were some risque things. Uh, I mean, uh, some people would uh, send a picture of their bold uh, um, uncle and they'll get back, uh, you know, a calm recommendation from Amazon. And so there were some interesting scenarios. And of course, uh, uh, clearly some people were, um, <laughs> you know, uh, if you're by yourself, you don't have a, a particular product to take a picture of and uh, invariably you end up taking a picture of something. And uh, <laughs> uh, again, that led to <laughs> all kinds of uh, hubris results. But, uh, you know, I'm digressing clearly. <laughs> uh, we ended up replacing later on this kind of a human uh, solution by an automated uh, computer solution. And so now, in fact, it's not called Amazon Remembers anymore. You don't take a picture. You simply try to identify a product uh, live. Uh, in a dynamic fashion, maybe a specific product or maybe a particular category, uh, uh, a category of products like shoes or laptops and so on. Now, we're getting closer to the main subject of the talk uh, because we're going to use another kind of machine learning called uh, supervised learning. And by the way, um, if you've use, I just want to plug Kinesis Analytics because it's awesome. Uh, it uses internally another type of machine learning and unsupervised learning uh, and in the form of random cut forest anomaly detection algorithms. So if you want to, uh, and oftentimes this is another case where a lot of customers face uh, the, this need of you know, having a signal and detecting anomalous behavior in that signal. And you can imagine all kinds of numeric signals out there. But anyways. Uh, in the supervised learning case, what we're trying to achieve is take an existing functioning system, which may consist of human components, may consist of you know, naturally occurring phenomena, processes, but also could be contraptions of sorts. And so in combination, there's some kind of system. Uh, and what we want to do is emulate that system build a model that behaves in a very similar fashion. So how do we do this? You know, we send, uh, we observe how that system behaves uh, in real life, right? Uh, it, it, given an input, it produces a kind of outcome or output. And we collect the history of these, and then we send it to, uh, in this case, Amazon Machine Learning Service, or some sort of supervised learning system where we build a model that represents uh, a similar kind of behavior. Now, why do we do that, by the way? So the idea is that with an unseen input, never seen uh, before, it will produce an outcome that will kind of imitate the original um, system. Why is this beneficial? If you think about it, we're trying to save on some resource here. Now, if there is a human component to that system, that could be an expensive system, right? And so we're trying to build a cheaper uh, model of that uh, system. But uh, sometimes it's not just 
cost, because the other important resource out there is time, right? Uh, and in case of, you know, churn prediction, we could simply wait and determine if the customer is going to leave us or not, but that's not the point, right? We want to be able to determine this earlier, so we want to save the time. And that's what we're trying to do. And there are other th uh, things like this, like fraud detection. Uh, maybe we could uh, determine earlier that, that uh, a fraud occurred. Okay, so now moving along to Amazon Machine Learning Service, this service allows us to address three types of problems. So it's binary classification where given uh, a new input, we say true, false, and in case of churn, this is exactly what we're going to use, right? This customer will leave the platform. No, this customer will not leave the platform or this service. Uh, of course, a slight generalization of this is a multi-class prediction problem. We treat them somewhat differently because with um, binary classification, there are some visualizations that are nicer, and you'll see an example of that in the console. And of, of course, you also have uh, numeric uh, regressions as another uh, kind of a problem. So now moving back to churn, uh, we're going to use a data set uh, that's been out there, and it deals with telecom kind of operators, the uh, behavior of customers uh, using some kind of cell phone plan. And this uh, slide shows you exactly the attributes that we're going to use. There are 21 attributes in the data set. It's a fairly small data set by uh, you know, modern standards, but it is sufficient, uh, as you will see later on, to actually produce uh, a working model. And then uh, we have different kinds of attributes in there. I kind of try to categorize them. So some of them talk about the customer. Uh, it, there's actually uh, the state. It's U.S. Uh, customers, so there's a state. There's area code and even a phone number uh, in there. Um, there are Boolean attributes, true, false. This customer has enabled an international calling plan. There's a voicemail plan. Um, there are behavioral attributes uh, in terms of the number of messages, the number of minutes, daytime, evening time, night time, and so on, calls, actual charges. And then at the bottom, there are some interesting, highly relevant attributes, such as account length. How long has this customer been with the company? This is in terms of days. Uh, customer service calls. Again, we might think that this is important, how many times uh, this particular customer actually called customer service. And then finally, churn, this is a Boolean attribute, and this is the target attribute that we care so much about. Uh, that's what we're trying to predict. But the training data set uh, will contain a true known historical value for that. And that's uh, the beauty about this problem is that typically in any kind of business, it's easy to obtain this historical data set, right? You would know historically that these customers left because oftentimes you don't. It's actually hard to obtain some training data set to, to build a model on. So we're lucky here. And uh, just to give you a kind of an idea that there is really nothing magical about this data set, uh, there's some state labels, you know, area codes. The second attribute is actually account uh, length, I believe, and so on and so forth. And, we have uh, the churn attribute, um, you know, good news, a lot of them are zero, which, is, which in this case means they didn't churn, they uh, stayed with um, the company. Okay, and so now let's try to build a model with this, uh, and I'll, I'll try to switch to my laptop here. The first step in building a model is creating a data source. Uh, a data source usually, uh, in the simplest form, it could be a CSV file that is saved in S3. And in this case, it's exactly like that. That CSV file is in S3. There are integrations that let you also create a data source based on data saved in Redshift and in uh, My, um, uh, MySQL uh, RDS. A database. So the first step is really simply point to that data source, uh, point to that file, 
Uh, and in the process of creating a data source, the data will be analyzed. There are some basic statistics that will be extracted. And so here's an example of an account length. You can kind of see the distribution of values um, and get a sense of what this attribute is like. Now remember churn, this is a binary attribute. Uh, so we might want to look at that as well. This is important here um, because this will be useful in our discussion later on. You see that the number of customers who actually left the platform is sizable but relatively small. In this case, it, it constitutes about 14.5% of customers. So just remember that number. Uh, it will be useful later on. And of course, there are other uh, numeric attributes here. You could see... Um, you know, customer service calls, we could tell that, um, you know, having one call or making one call is very common. Making no calls is also quite common. And then it kind of uh, tapers off. Um, but, you know, it's also a questionable attribute because maybe when you just came on board and started using the service, the fact that you've made several calls doesn't mean much, right? Because uh, you, maybe you're just learning or you, you don't know how things work. Right, so that's, that's not a defining attribute. That's all I want to say. Um, and once we've constructed this data source, we can then move on to uh, building an actual model with a couple of clicks. Uh, we can initiate that. Um, now, uh, I've already built the model because it takes a few minutes, tens of minutes sometimes, uh, depending on the size of the data. Um, and, uh, but, but looking at the other attributes, it's worth also seeing that there are some correlations to the target attribute. This may give you some idea as to, um, you know, which attributes may be more important uh, than others. But again, these are just individual correlations, and of course, you cannot make decisions purely on that. Um, but if you look at the model, uh, this is an evaluation that I'm showing right away. Um, if you look at the model... Uh, there's an input schema here, and there's also something called a recipe that's used. They make it larger. Hopefully you can see it. So this is one of the um, opportunities for you to influence how um, the machine learning is built. There's a recipe chosen by default. Uh, but you can, given your domain knowledge, try to influence uh, this uh, building of, of the model. And what are we seeing here? Um, so, first we group the attributes. Uh, and we just assign names uh, uh, to, to these groups. And the reason is that later on we can apply entire functions to this. So, for instance, here I'm saying normalize uh, all of these numeric attributes. What is the significance of normalization? I'll show you in a second, actually, if we go back to the slides. Right, all we're doing is just... Uh, you know, fitting a kind of a normal curve with a mean of zero and uh, variance of one. And so if your value, an average is about 100, right? And so that's why 107 is, is around zero and 128 is translated into, uh, you know, 0.8. So why do we apply normalization? Typically, you know, you may have very differing uh, numeric attributes in terms of their ranges. And sometimes uh, if a number, one of these attributes is too large in terms of the absolute value, it may actually influence uh, the algorithm that may be overpowering other attributes. And so it's useful to just bring them all together to roughly the same kind of range and the same kind of shape. And that's what I'm doing here. However, if we go back to uh, the recipe, we see that I don't apply the normalization to customer service calls. This is also a numeric attribute. And the idea here is exactly this, that, oh, maybe this attribute is actually more important than others. 
And so, but because its range is not so great, it's also kind of 0, 1, 2, 3, maybe 7, right? We've seen that. I just leave it as is. And again, this is where, you know, you, there's a bit of an art here. Um, and again, there's also a bit of an experimentation. You can leave things as they are. Uh, there's, in fact, a default recipe offered for you when you build a model. But, um, you know, here's your chance to apply your domain knowledge. I also eliminated the phone number itself because I thought, okay, the phone number maybe is, is not going to influence anything. This is not a trivial question, by the way, right? because uh, there could be some correlations. If this is a phone number that's hard to remember, maybe I'm more likely to leave uh, the service. Now, of course, nowadays you can actually keep your number if, if you switch to a different provider. So uh, maybe not so relevant, but still, that's not still universally globally available, and so that could influence it. But I decided, okay, I'll, I'll just drop it and, and not include it. And state area code, these are categorical kind of attributes that I'm going to use, and all binary are, are left as, uh, as they are. Okay, so that's all really, the, that, that's all the input that I've provided here beyond the standard defaults. And building a model, um, we saw a kind of an evaluation of it. There is an automatic evaluation performed. And with binary a classification, you get this uh, useful graph. And it's worth taking some time to explain what is shown here. So first of all, the 3,000 data set is actually split into the training and the testing data set. So we leave some uh, amount of data to perform an evaluation, right? Because uh, if we didn't do that, um, we, you know, it's likely that the model or some models could overfit, and, and they the models perform really well on the data they've seen, but really poorly on the data they, they've never seen, right? Um, and so we want to set aside the testing data set. So this graph is actually produced by taking the testing data set, 1,000, about 1,000 points, and plotting the distribution of scores that the model produces. And I should tell you at this point that the model actually doesn't give you 0 and 1. It gives you a number between 0 and 1 in that range. And it's our opportunity here to kind of tune the model by picking a cutoff, picking a threshold, deciding, you know, if the number is bigger than that, then we're going to treat it as, as one versus the other. And that's what this graph is really all about. So the zero class here is no churn, and one means customer did churn. The gray line in this graph, in fact, uh, uh, you know, because of the scale, it goes way up here. Uh, it's a bit cut off, but um, the gray line represents the distribution of customers that did not churn, right? And so it's kind of good news that a lot of them are closer to zero than one. Um, and the black line represents the distribution of scores over customers that actually did churn. And here the news are not so great, right? Because you're seeing still that there's quite a number of them that congregate around zero which means that they will be labeled as not churning when, in fact, they, they do uh, churn. And then it gets a little bit murkier when we get closer to 1. Now, here's how an ideal picture looks like. Right? You would like these two distributions to be cleanly separated. Here's one, here's another. There's a slight overlap here. Right? Maybe we'll get a few errors. But, uh, I mean, that's even better. But in any kind of practical scenario, you're not going to see this, right? In fact, if it was so simple, then probably you don't need machine learning to solve this problem. You could use some sort of rule system and so on, uh, maybe something much, much simpler. So here's a very realistic uh, picture. And what do we do with this? I mean, is this good? Can I actually apply it? Uh, does it make any sense? Um, well. We're getting some results here because uh, uh, we see that 14% are actually errors. That's what the system makes if our 
threshold is set to be 0, 3. And by the way, this is very dynamic. If you haven't used this, you can kind of move this around, and you can see how things are changing. Um, so if, in fact, I try to kind of move things around, if I look at the total error, it kind of stays you know, higher than the 14 that I've seen, right? So this is the 14%, 14, 14. OK, so maybe somewhere here around 0.3 is really the best that I can get. Um, and now let's recall that 14.5% of customers churn, right? That's just the kind of statistics that we get from the data set. Um, and my model is making about the same number of errors in terms of percentage, right? So is this useful? And maybe I should just forget about machine learning and, and just assume nobody churns and go with uh, the standard approach, and I'll be making the same number of errors, right? Well, here it turns out that we need to dig a little deeper and understand what these errors and, uh, represent in this kind of domain. And often that's what you need to do. So let's look at these. False negative, false positive, true positive, true negative. What, what does this all mean in this domain? False negative means that I incorrectly labeled this customer as not churning, right? So I said, no, not going to churn, but in fact, uh, that customer will leave later on. Possibly a costly mistake. Um, and then false positive is when I said, yeah, this customer is going to churn, uh, but they, they don't. Uh, they're, they're happy, they're loyal, and, and they continue to. Again, um, maybe not such a terrible mistake to make, but uh, again, we need to understand what that means, what are the implications for my business. Why am I employing this machine learning model? What is it that I'm going to do with it? Now let's think about the churn um, use case. If I know the customer is going to leave, I will try to offer some incentives for them to stay, right? Now with cell phone providers, what would be the incentives? Um, maybe I can offer a free upgrade, right? Uh, hardware. Maybe I can give some sort of discount on something. Um, something that uh, I can make uh, the customer a bit happier with. Now, on the other side, if the customer is leaving, what, is the what does it cost to me when I lose a customer? Right? And so this is, these are all very important questions. And so going back to kind of my slides, you need to take into account the costs. For customers that are leaving, obviously you're going to lose your cash flow. Um, to reacquire another customer in place of a uh, lost one, there will be some advertising costs for me. Uh, when a new customer signs up, you know, point of sale, uh, admin costs. Um, maybe, again, there will be some hardware discount that will be included and so on. These are not small costs. In fact, uh, there have been some um, sort of publications uh, where some kind of well-known uh, telcos in U.S. Uh, said that it could cost hundreds of dollars, actually, to lose a customer. Um, and uh, so sometimes 350 in one article, and some article may be a, a different amount. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to assign some costs and say, if the customer is leaving, for simplicity's sake, and this is realistic, the, uh, we'll assume that it costs us $500, right, to lose, if we lose the customer. What does it cost us if we make another mistake? So in this case, there's false positive, right? We'll probably offer an incentive to a customer that was going to stay anyways. Now, is that so bad? Clearly, you would lose some money, but maybe you'll increase the loyalty on the customer uh, that was already loyal. OK, so all in all, um, it could actually be acceptable. And these incentives could oftentimes be much smaller, right? I mean, it's conceivable that I can offer even a $50 kind of uh, incentive to the customer, and that might be enough, maybe $100. Um, and so this is the cost that we'll pay regardless of whether the customer, whether, you know, for false positives and for true positives, we'll have to expand that cost. And the only time where we don't have any costs, uh, at least in this simplistic model, is when the model says, no, this customer is not going to churn, and it is true, they're not going to churn. 
We do nothing. We continue operating uh, as usual. Okay. There are some other cases where it's much less trivial how to assign these costs, of course. It's not as simple as, as, as with telco. So for instance, in another common demo um, that I've done uh, with uh, social media classification and Twitter, uh, there we're trying to determine if it's worth responding to a particular tweet or not. Right? So we'll try to say, is this an actionable tweet? Do I need to have my customer support kind of respond to it? Or do I just ignore it because it's you know, congratulatory and something like this? Um, so what are my costs in this scenario? Uh, I could obviously, if I miss an important actionable tweet, there is some cost to my reputation potentially, but how do I put a numeric value to it? It's, it's not so easy. Um, Okay, but what about if I make another kind of error? What, is, uh, what if it's a false positive? I label the tweet as actionable. Well, in this case, it will probably go to a human to review, and it'll probably take just a few seconds for the human to determine, no, it's, it's, it's not worth responding. It's actually a mistake. So the cost there would probably be small, right? What about the cost of, um, let's see, we covered the true, the true positive uh, in this case is yes, the, uh, the tweet is actionable. What if um, it's true, let's see, so we have true positive, true negative there. <laughs> uh, sorry, true positive, true negative. So, so in, in one case here, in this scenario, you might seem, oh, well, the cost is actually zero if the customer um, doesn't, let's see, let me collect my train of thought here. <laughs> uh, the, this could be a tricky uh, situation. So um, in the false, in the false negative case, we know that the that tweet um, was labeled as non-actionable, but in fact it was, right? So we need to have um, a small expense of looking uh, at it. And in the false positive case, sorry, that's the false positive. In the false negative, um, there's cost to reputation. And the true negative uh, is when the tweet is non-actionable. And, and then the true positive, the tweet is actually is actionable. So in these two cases, non-actionable uh, non and actionable, in, in case of true, what are the costs? Is it, so clearly if I say, oh yes, this is an actionable tweet, please look at it and respond to it, I will have to expand you know, some human resources. And it, they could be substantial because I need to understand what the tweet is about and I need to write a response. So could this be more expensive than the false, <laughs> the false negative case uh, of, of my loss uh, of reputation, right? Let's consider these two. <laughs> Again, goes to show that it's not easy to think about these things. But um, let's say the cost to reputation is $10, right? Uh, and my cost uh, of human effort on this, could it be uh, higher than the cost to, rep to the lost reputation? That's the key question here. Because if you say, look, uh, okay, reputation, maybe it's $10, but my human cost, I actually have to pay the salary of somebody to look at the tweet, maybe spend 20 minutes answering it. Right? Uh, 
maybe that's actually $20 or, or something. But if that is the case, then maybe it's actually cheaper for you to ignore all the tweets because the, your reputation is lower <laughs> than the cost of a human responding to it, right? But that, that's not really the case. That cannot be the case because you must, since you've built that system of responding to tweets, there must be some intrinsic value uh, to your brand in responding to customers. So it cannot be like that lost reputation cannot be lower than the cost of, of processing a tweet. Otherwise, um, uh, that would be a, a useless exercise. So you have to be really careful in, in assigning these costs. I just want to highlight that this is not a trivial exercise, but it's worth doing. OK. Now, going back to our uh, example here, if we do nothing, we know 14 and a half customers actually leave the platform, and we can assign a cost of $500, which means that by multiplying the two per customer, uh, there is a cost of $72 of basically doing nothing. Right? If, if I do nothing, if I just assume that nobody churns, nobody leaves my platform, then to maintain my pool of customers, I have to actually spend $72 per customer. Right? Well, hopefully you're earning more than that to compensate for this. Uh, otherwise, it would not be a profitable business. Um, OK. And now, if I assume that my retention cost is $100, I'd like to find that sweet spot where the combination of true and false positives and, of course, the false negative, which is costly for us, will produce a lower cost. And in fact, it turns out that it is possible to do so in this uh, model. So I can find a cutoff value, and it's about 0 0.17, that will produce these numbers. And I can clearly demonstrate that in this case, my cost with applying machine learning is actually $50 per customer, not 72. And I'm clearly saving here $22 of, uh, per, per customer. And that's not something to sneeze at. Uh, it could be a significant amount. And now you can actually think about this in monitor terms. Uh, here is my do nothing approach. Here's my machine learning approach. You could actually use different kinds of models. They don't have to be always machine learning models. You can have maybe a rule-based model that you used before to determine whether you know, a customer is likely to leave or not. Maybe it was you know, if the number of customer service calls in one month were greater than five, right? Uh, let me do something. Uh, and now you can build a financial model around all of these approaches and compare them and make a decision. And in this case, uh, I can say, OK, I can save money with machine learning. Uh, now, granted, this is a simple model of churn. There are different kinds of churn out there. You know, it could be that a customer decided to switch from a higher costing plan to a lower costing plan. You could view this as a kind of a churn. Um, and, and also, there's clearly an assumption here, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, that we assume that if we pay this retention cost, the customer will actually stay. <laughs> That's not necessarily the case, right? So we have to account for this. And you could see that there are also different product lines, different types of services, subservices, and you can try to make that model a bit more complicated. But again, my message is very simple. Uh, don't just assume uh, and don't look at this uh, with, uh, at face value. And by the way, um, I have uh, written a script that helps you figure out where is that sweet point based on your costs. Uh, let me see if I can show you. Because here in the console, all you see is just total error. Um, and ideally, we'd want something that would based on cost, select the threshold for you. So the script I wrote um, works kind of like this. Uh, it's simple Python. You can specify 
that this is my machine learning model. So dash M option tells you this is the model ID. Um, and this is the dash D is the data source ID of the testing data set. So for me to replicate exactly what this uh, graph I was showing to you, I need to take the data, the testing data set and run it against the machine learning model, extract the predictions, uh, and then compare them to the true labels that we knew about. And I can specify here the costs. If I didn't say what my um, true negative cost is, it assumed to be zero. And again, these are sort of artificial units. They could be dollars or whatever. Uh, this actually kicks off a batch prediction, so it may take a couple of minutes. Uh, I've done that before, and so another way to use the script is actually to simply specify the batch prediction ID that's already been run. Uh, so I have my uh, predictions, and I can say, you know, true positive, false positive, both cost me the same, $100. So false negative costs uh, 500 And it tries to build the uh, simple mat, uh, uh, MATLAB-like plots. So you could see that in this diagram, first of all, this one here looks very much like what uh, Amazon Machine Learning Console is showing to you. Uh, and this one instead builds a graph of costs depending on where the threshold is. And so clearly it shows where the lowest point on the graph of 0.17. You can, of course, uh, try to zoom in and so on and so forth. All right, and that's all uh, on the console here. It shows best threshold and lowest cost produced, 50.3, okay, 50.4. Um, and that's really it. I have um, made this script available. In GitHub, a link is at the bottom. I need to provide some more uh, documentation, but uh, if you just run the dash H for help, it shows you all the options, and they're pretty self-explanatory. And folks, that's uh, pretty much it for my talk. Um, I give you some additional links here about machine learning. Um, these are uh, useful. Uh, you can try to create models. Uh, the first one goes through the tutorial or gives you some interesting quick starts. And then there are general developer resources. Uh, that's all. Thank you for coming. Um, and don't forget to uh, fill out the evaluations. Hopefully this was useful. <laughs>